overview of the morning. First off, we'll be having a conversation on aviation, followed directly by our Smart Cities panel. Then we'll have a break and we'll close out the morning with designing environmentally sustainable cities. Uh, the hospitality suite is open, as you know, in the stock exchange room just across the hall uh, the whole time, so if you need coffee or water. Um, please silence your phones, but we'd really encourage you to tweet. It's at Chicago Forum, and the hashtag is Global Cities 2015. There is Wi-Fi in here, um, and if you just go into your Wi-Fi, it says Art Institute, and there is no password. Um, all of these sessions are, of course, on the record, and we are live streaming. Now, please join me in welcoming to the stage for the first session this morning, the Financial Times' Edward Luce, and for the conversation on aviation with the Boeing Company and United Airlines. Thank you. Thanks, Neve. Um, oh, we've got a plane. That's fitting. Um, so um, we're here with uh, Jim Compton, who's um, the vice chair of United Airlines um, and um, chief revenue officer, um, and Dennis Mullenberg, who's the vice chair of Boeing um, and the chief operating officer. So two of the big aviation companies in the world, but also two of the big Chicago companies. Both have their global corporate HQ here. And I have to say, I was tempted, given that I'm a frequent flyer, I was tempted to bombard you with softball questions, Jim, because I really want to get into that 1K category. Yeah. Um, but then I thought, look, man, yeah, but no, then I thought 25, well, I'm doing quite well on miles anyway this year, so, well, and we've can, only got 25. I can give you ideas how to get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about an upgrade afterwards. Um, but, uh, so let me start off with a relatively hardball question. Um, if you look at the global surveys of airports, um, it doesn't matter whether you look at the consumer or industry rankings, pretty much across the board, no American airport comes in the top 30 nowadays. And you have to go to sort of 35 to start with Denver. And then you get to San Francisco at 40, roughly that, no hairs below that even. Um, it's dominated by East Asians. It's dominated, you know, Changi Airport is usually number one, Hong Kong, Beijing, Narita, um, and then a couple of Europeans, Zurich, Schiphol in Amsterdam. Um, what are American airports doing wrong? Or, what, or rather, what is it that Munich and Zurich and Tokyo and Singapore are doing right? And then we can, then we can get into Chicago because there are a lot of specific issues. Jim, Jim, let me start with you, but I'd like to hear both of your, both of your answers on this. Yeah, I think, you know, um, there's a lot happening in this space, first of all, and um, I think as you think about, uh, obviously, with our global network and where we touch around the world, uh, we see lots of activity. Um, I think the, uh, um, you know, the, the overriding consistent um, that we watch and look for is, uh, are all parties involved, all the constituents in terms of what that means in airport in a given area, uh, so that that un input uh, is very much broad-based, uh, one. Secondly, we look for efficiency. Um, you know, this is a highly competitive business, the aviation, and global cities, cities in the U.S., all compete against each other. And so as we think about infrastructure uh, and the need for infrastructure, uh, that that stays in line with what the demand expectations are and are done in a very efficient way, and all constituents are at the table helping to make those decisions. Okay, so uh, th there is an inefficient, I think you're being polite here, there's an inefficiency problem with, with the management of big American airports. That, I mean, what's, what is the best practice you look to that you'd like to see um, for O'Hare or for um, JFK or um, wh which countries do you look at? Which aviation management, airport management models do you think we should be studying here? Well, I think, you know, examples of, uh, I think, successes we've seen um, is uh, some of the work that uh, London Heathrow and the new terminal that we're in uh, and our participation in that. Um, again, we feel we're at the table, the airport authority. Uh, it meets with us regularly. Uh, they were in Chicago uh, recently and met with them. Um, and uh, it's a, you know, a lining of interests that, uh, you know, the use of technology and, 
and uh, customers wanting self-service and how that it, it, it builds into the infrastructure. Uh, so London Heathrow would be an example of where in our new terminal we've seen terrific work with uh, the airport. That's interesting. I mean, interesting you should mention Heathrow because it is similar in terms of the, you know, the sort of heavy infrastructure, the, the land use rights, noise pollution groups, etc. The contentiousness you get around airports in London is pretty similar to what maybe you're having with O'Head. Do you agree with that, Dennis, and, I, and I, your broader thoughts as well? I, I, I do, and the, I think the other thing, just, just to build on Jim's point, is that we see these, these leading global cities that are investing in infrastructure have made the connection between investing in aviation and the broader economic benefit. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that in the, in the Middle East investment, Asia Pacific investment, where they recognize the fact that uh, every dollar that they put into aviation infrastructure is producing about a, a dollar and a half to three dollars of economic benefit. So the multiplier effect is great. Yeah. Um, America is the home of aviation. It's also, you know, the, the kind of country that thinks multiplier effects. This is the home of capitalism. Um, why aren't we seeing better multiplier uh, investments that will create better multiplier effects in U.S. airports? Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, again, getting all the constituencies together so that that economic equation, that right. benefit, is, is recognized and becomes tangible. You know, I, just to give you a sense of the importance of doing this, uh, aviation infrastructure today generates about $2.2 trillion of economic benefit worldwide. Mm -hmm. We have about 3 billion travelers in the system today, and over the next 15 years, we think that 3 billion is going to go to 7 billion. Now, those travelers... Uh, will want to travel to global destinations and cities that are making the investment in infrastructure will attract more of those passengers and, and reap the economic benefits. So I think it's a, getting all the constituencies together to recognize that that integrated economic benefit helps make the business case for So if we're going to have investment. 7 billion human beings flying every year, that's what, seven times the number of people on the planet at the beginning of the 20th century, we're going to have to find best practices on how you deal with congestion, runway expansion, yes. the infrastructure around airports. Which examples are you looking to? Who are the models? Which cities do this best? Well, when, when I take a look at what's going on in places like, uh, like Singapore and uh, yep. uh, look at the investments that are being made in the Middle East in places like uh, Abu Dhabi mm -hmm. and Dubai, uh, they've invested in more efficient infrastructure and the air traffic uh, modernization system around it so that you can provide efficient traffic uh, that not only reduces fuel consumption, but also reduces uh, noise footprint and, and makes uh, the airport infrastructure compatible with the rest of the broader uh, city communities. I, I think it really gets back to this idea of an integrated investment in aviation infrastructure that connects all the constituencies that, uh, that Jim was talking about. Well, it does strike me, one of the reasons I thought your London answer was interesting is that most of the examples we would cite would be countries where let's say democracy isn't sort of the most obvious characteristic, and therefore building infrastructure, expropriating land, et cetera, is an easier, more efficient job. You know, Dubai, that you can import the labor and then export it. It's a different model. Yeah. Um, but I, you're probably not going to want to get into that. Um, <laughs> let's but it, it is, it is a large to, capital You're happy. OK, Jim, Jim, let's <laughs> talk about that. Um, you look at the investments China is making, for example. And Beijing is one of its top 10 airports in pretty much every survey. Um, why did, let's get into Chicago and the challenges for O'Hare, because Mayor Rahm Emanuel wants O'Hare, has a very declared, um, explicitly declared ambition to make O'Hare the best airport in the world, not just in America. Um, uh, but first of all, just if you could briefly, Captain, why did you choose Chicago, um, Dennis? Mm. Why did Boeing choose Chicago as its global headquarters? Yeah. Well, when, when you look at that uh, decision, this was after the, uh, the merger of uh, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, Rockwell, and several companies. So our desire was to put our headquarters in a global city mm -hmm. that had access to all of our infrastructure and, uh, and building capability, mm -hmm. design capability here in the U.S., but also connect us out to our global supply chain and to our global customer base. And when we evaluated all the options for a headquarters city, city we came down to Chicago as our preferred location principally because of that global connectivity opportunity. Now, as you're, as you're pointing out, to stay at the leading edge of global connectivity requires long-term investment. But that, that was the, the fundamental underpinning of uh, selecting Chicago as our headquarters city. And because you've, be, you've been here longer, it's a hub for you, and I guess it's, it's been less of a recent decision, but is there any reevaluation of whether Chicago is the right HQ for United? 
Oh, Chicago's the perfect home for us. I mean, and, and adding, you know, building on what Dennis said, we're obviously a global network, and uh, the globalness that Chicago represents is, is really important to us. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned the mayor. We have a mayor that gets it, right? It's about building a foundation um, that has top-notch universities, so you have talent. Um, it has the infrastructure and the, the drawing of uh, corporations uh, such as Boeing into the city, and we're seeing that in the work that he's done. So we, when you have, you know, I'm on the revenue side. The revenue side chases demand. That's what we do. Um, and that demand's foundation is built largely by the success of, of, of cities that are able to attract demand, attract corporations, the benefits that brings. Um, and uh, I think the mayor's done a terrific job of, of doing that here in Chicago. So in terms of his ambitions, uh, he's just appointed a new um, aviation commissioner, Ginger Rogers, not Rogers, Ginger Evans, Ginger Evans, um, who, from Washington. Um, uh, her declared sort of goal is to execute his vision to make O'Hare. Now, what do you need to do? I mean, it strikes me as a consumer, mm. you know, using um, uh, the green line. Or to, it takes an hour to get into the loop. Um, the traffic's obviously the traffic. Um, can you be a globally um, impressive airport without high-speed connection between downtown and airport? Well, clearly that would be a wonderful asset to have, right? And I, I think that um, uh, the, the city is focusing on that and, and working through, you know, the uh, the um, whether or not it's feasible. I think it also, from our perspective, um, it also is, you know, no different than what route you fly. There's opportunity cost of different things you do, right? And so that there's a prioritization of where the, of what that infrastructure is and where that line to from downtown to airport falls is a good debate to have versus some of the other infrastructure. Um, well, I mean, I guess that, I mean, that gets back to my first question. I live in Washington, D.C., and the line, the high-speed line to Dulles <laughs> is going to be completed sometime in the 22nd century, I think, when <laughs> it's, gonna, it's ready. Yeah. There generous. isn't, no, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I, I, not necessarily a joke. I mean, there isn't, you know, a connection um, really with LaGuardia, La well, more importantly with JFK from Manhattan that, that's satisfactory. Um, uh, and again, that's why I was interested you mentioned London, because London is generally an infrastructure, mm. infrastructural challenge. It's not a pleasant experience yeah. being mass transit in London. If London can do a high-speed rail link um, to its main airport, um, what is stopping Chicago? I mean, you, you were tactful in your reply. I'm sure you'd love to see high-speed uh, link from the loop to, um, to O'Hare. What's, what, what's your, what, what are the odds of that happening and by when? Well, it's <laughs> hard for me to put, put numbers no, it's on not. That. I know it's not your job but, to do it, but it's your but business. You, you, think, you think about infrastructure investment. So, so I agree with you on the, on the idea that high-speed rail and enhanced ground infrastructure mm -hmm. to make the, the ground transport connectivity efficient is mm -hmm. important. And, and uh, you know, others will make the decisions on the priority of that investment, but it, it's something that is an enabler mm -hmm. for the broader uh, traffic connectivity. It's also important that along with ground infrastructure, we think about the air infrastructure. Mm -hmm. so this is air uh, traffic modernization, uh, a system that will allow more efficient use of the airspace, uh, which can also reduce fuel consumption, can reduce emissions, can reduce uh, sound footprint, and make overall airport operations more compatible with the community. So I, I would think about ground investment, mm -hmm. including high-speed rail, air traffic modernization in the airspace. And then also, uh, I, I think it back, gets back to Jim's point on, on the whole ecosystem that surrounds aviation investment. It's investing in talent. It's investing in the, in the people that operate in the aviation industry and the aviation infrastructure, uh, investment in, in the, the STEM talent base uh, that I know the mayor has made a priority. Mm -hmm. uh, those are all elements of creating a successful aviation ecosystem that then allows you to reap the, the economic benefit. Jim, do you have a forecast? Well, yeah, I think, in, um, you know, the way I think about it is a lot of these issues, um, when you take them in isolation, mm -hmm. it's a different debate than when you try to think of them across, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, a high-speed rail between airports and, and downtowns and things like that, 
is also up against you know, some of the things that Dennis just mentioned. Um, the sh the, you know, there's a conversation of how do you improve the airspace in an area like Chicago so that that is even much, you know, the efficiency and reducing ground delay programs at O'Hare might be more consumer benefit than that. And so, what, not to, so, so to anyone in isolation can be, can be a terrific idea. The question is, and it, it evolves into, I think, what's lacking in our country is a lack of a national airline policy. Right, okay, so I, I was going to get onto that. I mean, as strictly speaking, this is about cities, but if we're talking about the future of aviation, federal policy cannot be ignored. And the fact that the Federal Aviation Administration Authority is, is um, underfunded, the fact that its air traffic control system is still based on 1950s ATM technology, um, I know isn't necessarily a safety issue, touch wood, mm. um, but it is an efficiency issue. Yep. How big a, a problem is this for everything we're talking about? And what are the chances that Congress is going to actually see what priorities really should be and do something about FAA and give it the, the, the budget and the authorization to, 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 to have a 21st century air traffic control system? Yeah. I, I think it's the, the singular most important investment we can make as a nation as an enabler mm -hmm. across all the infrastructure. The FAA uh, reauthorization is up for renewal by the end of September and you know, right. is currently being worked through on the, on the Hill. As part of that, it's funding for uh, NextGen, which is the air traffic modernization system nationwide. And I think uh, we, our, our airline customers, the whole aviation community, see that as a really important investment. And that will move us to a technology that's modern and efficient. Um, there are estimates that it will improve efficiency in the airspace by 20 to 30 percent, mm -hmm. that it could reduce fuel consumption and carbon emissions by more than 12 percent, mm -hmm. uh, significantly reduce the sound uh, impact, environmental impact on the ground. Um, enabling the technology that it's in new airplanes like the 787. This airplane is 60% quieter. Uh, mm -hmm. We ought to take advantage of it in terms of the air traffic system design. So these are all incredible enablers for the country, and uh, we need support so through the FAA reauthorization to, to fund next gen. We're talking, what, $20, $30 billion over a decade? I don't, I don't, I don't know the exact time horizon, but yep. um, it's, it's not a huge chunk of any budget, and it's an, a hugely high return on investment um, capital outlay. Where is the problem coming from here? I mean, are, are, are competitors, you know, in other mm. countries lobbying against this? Um, are, is there an ideological block? What's stopping doing what's absolutely necessary in a common sense? I think, I mean, you're right, Ed, there are there were success stories out there, the UK, Canada, Australia, um, that have uh, next-gen systems that have uh, clearly not been successful at driving toward efficiency in terms of the airspace. Um, and, uh, you know, as in terms of uh, uh, the FAA, uh, you know, we're a big proponent of a nonprofit corporate governance structure where you're able, you know, you mentioned safety. We have the safest system in the world, right? Um, but it's a slow system. Mm -hmm. Right, it's the World War II, 1950s, radar base, mm -hmm. um, and when things thunderstorms come in, you space airplanes further apart, right, and you lose a lot of the efficiency that a next gen <coughs> system. And I think there's a lot of work on next gen. I was just in New York last week with Administrator Huerta of the Datacom program. That's a, a piece of next gen that we're doing at Newark. Um, so there's work there. But we believe that if there was a different structure in the FAA, a non-profit -co non corporate structure, where the users would pay the fees, right, where the users, and it's distributed quickly, we think that would generate a governance that's much more efficient, much more nimble, free up a management team that doesn't have to be tied to some of the political things that I think get tied up in the way the structure is today. In other words, Congress would sort of basically cede day-to-day -day control. They're not fond of doing that, are they? I mean, that's not their track record recently. But there's, you know, uh, there, there's discussion in Washington happening with reauthorization this September, Around right? And so changing the, the, um, the conversations are happening, and uh, you know, we'll see how that plays out. But you know, uh, it, it's been a long time since the conversations have been happening. 
And I, th I think the other key point here, Ed, is year-to-year is -year consistency. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a decade-long kind of project. Mm -hmm. It takes commitment and consistency mm -hmm. and, and steady annual funding. And, and frankly, what's tripping up the process today is that the funding varies year to year, and that inconsistency uh, doesn't allow us to do the long-term uh, planning and long-term capital investment. So consistency in the budgeting process, a long-term plan, we lay in that foundation. This is a very doable set of technologies, and uh, uh, consistency in planning will allow us to, to execute it. So talking about consistency in planning, the other Washington issue that affects you in particular is the reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. Yes. Now, Boeing's clearly become a bogeyman of corporate welfare. You are subsidized, and there is a, a genuine material risk that Exim will not be reauthorized. Yeah. Um, how are you coping with that uncertainty, and what do you expect will happen? Well, we, we, we think this is a very important topic. So Exim Bank uh, reauthorization uh, needs to occur by the end of June. So we're, we're about a month away now. This is an important, very important economic enabler for our country. And again, you know, some have uh, suggested that this is a, a corporate welfare of some sort and attributing that to benefiting big companies. Uh, I think it's worth noting again that uh, even big companies like Boeing, and, and we do uh, leverage the XM Bank with our customers where appropriate, but uh, every dollar uh, that comes to Boeing uh, through this process, 70% uh, of that goes out to our, our supply chain. They're 70 percent of our business base. That's 16,000 businesses. Mm -hmm. That's millions of jobs across the U.S. And the connectivity between having an XM bank in the U.S. and U.S. manufacturing jobs is very, very clear. And it seems to me that, that, that you've got vast export subsidy operations um, in places like China it, and growing. Every, every country in the world that operates in the aerospace sector has export credit financing. Europe has three export credit banks Absolutely. similar to XM. Uh, if the U.S. were to not reauthorize the XM bank, it's in essence uh, unilaterally disarming in a globally competitive environment. It makes no economic sense for the U.S. not to have an export credit agency when every other country that operates in the aerospace sector does. Can I ask you to predict, do you think this is going to get reauthorized? Uh, we think it will. We still think it's a very tough political battle. But if we, uh, if we look at both the Senate and the House and, uh, and talking to uh, individual members, we think the, f the, the fundamental support is there. Uh, so you talk just, to them very slowly and gently and, and, and patiently. And we, we, we're, we're encouraging a, a vote on the floor. And I think mm -hmm. as we've heard recently from the Senate, uh, they plan to, to hold that vote in June, and we're hopeful that'll be successful. But again, this, this makes great economic sense for the country. It's great sense for uh, jobs generation. And ultimately, I, th I think it's good for our airline customers as well. Um, let me get into um, the 787, the Dreamliner, your big, um, your, your big newish airline, and um, you know, technologically and in terms mm -hmm. of innovation, the most advanced. Um, United, I believe, are what second or third largest customer of, of using the Dreamliner, and you're flying from places like. LA to Melbourne, you're doing sort of yep. the kind of flights, length flights that we wouldn't have seen prior to the 787. Um, let me start with you, Jim. What, what impact is having the Dreamliner uh, having on your market, on, on airline, the airline business? Yeah, it's having a, it's a significant impact for us. Um, you, know, you take that market, LA, Melbourne, for instance, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, Fly to Sydney. We used to we, we fly to Sydney today, but we would tag Sydney to Melbourne. Right. right? Um, the economics on that segment, because it, we're not in that market, it really really poor. Um, the ability to fly LA to Melbourne on another aircraft, say a triple seven, mm -hmm. um, the market size wouldn't support it. Along comes the seven eight seven. It flies the distance of that triple seven, but but at a capacity that fits the demand for that market, um, just changes the game for us in a market like LA, LA Melbourne. It comes with you know, up to 20% more fuel efficient. Um, the customer satisfaction on that aircraft is terrific. Um, it's, uh, you know, when you hear, uh, I can remember in that, back in 2004 in, in the boardrooms where Boeing was presenting the 787 to us and talking about the pressurization of the cabin and wondering if that's really 
a factor, but pressurizing it at 6,000 feet and the studies they've shown and, um, and the customers coming off saying that they're relaxed, that it feels different. Uh, so from a customer experience, it's a, it's a huge win for us also. Um, but the biggest thing is that it does open up new markets. So um, we fly Denver to Tokyo today. Mm, Denver, um, Tokyo. Mm -hmm. Another market that with the size of the aircraft uh, makes it work perfectly for us in a market like that. Um, and so that technology um, has been really important to our network. Dennis, where's the biggest growth in your order book for this? Which is, it, is there any geographic concentration? I know the Japanese are the largest customers at the moment, but. Yes. Well, it, it, it's customers that fly these long haul routes that, uh, that Jim is describing. Mm -hmm. So the growth base is here in the United States. And uh, again, uh, United's been our partner for a lot of aircraft launches. They were our launch customer for the 777, our US launch customer for the 787, and the overall global launch customer for the 787-10. And uh, uh, customers with those global networks and, uh, and long point-to-point -point new city pair networks are, are really the operators here. Uh, Asia Pacific is a very strong market for us as well, as well as our, uh, our Benelis East carriers. And the, the technology in this airplane is, is an incredible transformation step forward in terms of aerodynamics, materials, propulsion systems. It's producing the kind of fuel savings uh, that Jim is seeing and uh, overall in the world, uh, we've got about 270 airplanes that have been delivered now, and 49 new city pairs have been opened up. 49 pairs for that this, did not exist for this month. before the 787. See, I can't, conversations like this, I just can't help thinking there's a kind of um, a dual reality of the, some of the most amazing innovation in the world, hmm. um, or the most amazing innovation in the world coming out of the United States, and then this clunky government that, <laughs> screwing stuff up for you. Um, what, you know, to, to what extent do you hope you can migrate some of your practices to them? Um, I'm sorry to get back to, but this does seem to be where, where it's at, this topic, when you think of America. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we, this is a continuous process, and, and our two companies are uh, engaged with the U.S. government, local governments, as part of our normal process. And it, it's challenging, but we, we have to admit this, the system we have today is, is a very capable, safe system. Um, there are investment opportunities to make it more efficient, to make it world-class, to make it globally competitive. And, and we think it's important that as we all engage our, uh, our government and our representatives uh, in that, in that uh, infrastructure, that we think about investing in aviation as a mechanism to create global competitiveness uh -huh. and global economic benefit. And I, I'm not sure that that connection is always made and it's important for us to be able to voice that. You're admirably polite. Thank you, At the risk, at the risk <laughs> of jeopardizing my United Mileage Plus account, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna end in a hardball question. Global surveys of airline experience um, are similar to the ones of airport experience. No American airline appear, appears on the top 30, and it seems to be pretty consistent depend, across surveys. Um, why is that? Why, I'm sorry. Yeah, why, why do no American Airlines get in the top 30 in terms of consumer feedback globally for the global surveys? The, um, the you know, our approach, one, is obviously we listen to our customers, mm -hmm. right? And so um, the, uh, and our, the, our focus uh, at United is on improving our liability, which uh, is a continuous process that uh, we know that we can do better and we'll continue to do better. And uh, it's a process of uh, investing in that, um, which uh, for us probably was underinvested in, and now we've stepped up the investment reliability. So when, it re when we hear from customers and when you look at satisfaction, um, the, th the piece that moves satisfaction the most in any data is doing what you say you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. right? You leave when you say and arrive when you say. Mm -hmm. When you step beyond that, there are things that move satisfaction. Charges, having charges for stuff. Well, I think what, the, uh, what, we're, what we're focused is on is asking As opposed customers to embedding it in the ticket price. What they're willing to pay for, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so I think as you think about the industry, where we've come to where we're going mm -hmm. and what innovation is doing, mm -hmm is allowing us as an airline to have a much more one-on-one -on -one relationship with an individual customer 
to find out what they're willing to pay for. Um, and so there are, you know, the data would say, and you hear the airlines quoted that pricing is basically, you know, 11% down on a real terms from 2000. It's a really competitive environment, and uh, there are a lot of bargains out there. Um, but people are also willing to pay to improve that experience. And so at United, that's introducing the economy plus. It's introducing the ability to buy into first class. Um, it's, it's other ancillary products that uh, we look for and ask our customers what they're willing to pay for. Like treating moderators really well and on flights, <laughs> yeah. stuff, like, stuff like that. No, I agree. I'm with you on, so, on all of that. So I think as um, we, as, you know, as we're, we're really focused on, um, you know, improving, doing what we say we want to do, that reliability piece and improving that reliability piece and focusing on what customers are willing to pay for. Jim, Dennis, that was really a very good, efficient 25 minutes. Learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Great. Sorry, sorry. Are we in the right order? I forgot.